Welcome back to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian influencers, thought leaders, and entrepreneurs on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success. How do you biblically build your business? How do you do it in a way where God is involved with it, where you're not just praying and hoping, yet you're also not just sitting there logically building a business that everyone else does as well, but God's hand is truly on it, just as it was with those inside of the Bible. A great guest that I have on today, I got to hear his faith journey between him separately and his wife coming together and and that journey and, and piecing together just like you would see with Joseph, how do the things that seem seemingly insignificant or even negative towards the calling qualify the calling that led him into a place from the military to generating over $45 million a year through his sales systems through someone else's company, leading over a team of over 100 to now creating his own sales system. It's actually called Sales Farming, where they put a permanent stream of extra profits into the business using the dead leads in the company. And they say, or else you don't pay. Great conversation, phenomenal guy, and excited to introduce my friend, Joel Yi. Yo, man, I appreciate you being here and, and grateful to have you on God's Business Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Nick. Super excited to talk about uh, what God has done for business and life. Yeah, dude, I w I'm excited to hear it. We randomly ran into each other. I was hanging out with my friend Peng Jun uh, yes. and friend Xu Ying, and, and I know that you were crossing through there at the same time, even though we're both from the U.S., you're up in Canada, and we meet each other like you know, 30 hours away, realistically, with all right, the travel right. and all that stuff. Yeah. That was really cool. I think it was... What what was the you, Tropicana Mall? I think that's what they name it. Yeah, is. I think it's Tropicana Mall, right? And then we had um, I had lunch with them, Peng Jun and Xiu, and then you know you happened to be there with uh, Amanda, and that was awesome. <laughs> and yeah, Kingston, so, oh, you're, you're, you know, beautiful sun. Yeah, yeah, we can't leave out <laughs> Kingston. So it's just so right. cool, like crazy to see the the connection, and excited to see what that builds, and also what we get into here today. I know that we are talking about that you were running some stuff with a guy named Dan Locke, which people can look him up. They yeah. probably some of them already know him. Uh, back in the day. And I was like, were you a Christian then or before then? And you were like, no, I seem like something that you kind of grew up with, which is interesting. I yeah. didn't grow up like uh, my parents weren't Christians, nothing. Mm -hmm. Like I'm the first person I know in my family to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. So for yeah. you, tell me about that experience for you. Cause there's a time where you're brought up in the ways of the Lord, yes. but then there's another time where you have your 1, own experience and you have to have that to live it out. So 1, bring me through both of those. How'd you grow up? Yeah. And then also when did you have your experience? Yeah, and, and before I start, for everyone watching, that's also why I'm wearing this shirt. And I only wear these shirts now every single day. So the shirt is wow. uh, it's a Sunday, uh, but it's actually a local brand. They call it Heaven Made in Vancouver, Canada, and they're a Christian mm. apparel store. And they sell very nice cuts. So, you know, just, uh, <laughs> yeah, but going back to, I guess, my story of, you know, growing up Christian, um, like you said, I think the first 16 years of my life was more like following my parents to church because that was just a thing we did. Right. But at church, you know, when I was younger, you know, in my toddler and elementary school years, I would be running around with my friends, you know, doing a bit of kids church, uh, playing on the Game Boy, right, running around church and just doing all sorts of things, you know, having fun. Um, I also helped my mom a lot with the kids ministry. So she used to like teach. She still does actually to this day. She's probably done it for over 20 wow. years uh, back home in Malaysia because where we met Peng Jun in Malaysia, I'm from Malaysia, too. I'm just from the east side from a different island, island of Borneo. So I'm on the east side. So my parents, you know, we grew up in that church, Good News Fellowship. My mom still is in the kids ministry there. And then for about four or five years, I was also on the worship team when I was younger, um, you know, playing the guitar, singing, playing the bass guitar. Um, nice. But back then I never had like a personal relationship with God. It was more like my mom is doing this, so I have to do it. And I'm at church anyway, so why not just do, you know, a youth group and why not just get into worship, right? Um, yeah. And what about your dad during this time? Yeah, he was, he was an elder at church before too. Uh, he had, he ran a, he ran a small group. So very involved. My parents are both until, to, till today, very involved in church. And and was this a Malaysian church? Yeah. It was called Good News Fellowship in Kuching, Malaysia. Cool. And, and when did you, like, how long were you guys serving there before you left? Yeah. So I left for the States when I was 16, back in 2012. Cool. Um, I'm 27 yeah. this year, so it's about 10, 11 years now. And when I left, when I came to the States alone as an international student with no family, no friends in the U.S., that was when 
I guess like life really changed for me and I started experiencing God in a very personal way, right? Because ah, cool. when for the first time in life, when you're alone in a new place, really all you have is God. Or you could choose, you could actually, well, there's two options. You could choose to deny God or you could choose to have God, right? So thankfully I chose, I chose the, what, the latter? <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, what would you say was part of that? Just because I think that's interesting. Was there a certain church that you went to at the time or a community of people? And you yeah. know, where did you land as well? Like what area of the U.S.? And, and tell me what that process was that you took. Yeah, so I came to Auburn, Washington, basically near Seattle, Washington. Right, It's like 30 minutes from Seattle, south of Seattle. Yeah. Um, and the reason why we picked Seattle, Auburn is because – that college, Green River College, back then it was a community college. Now it's a college because uh, they have a four-year program. But back then they had a very special, like a high school diploma and community college thing combined where you could come in at 16. So I just met the minimum age so I could do both high school and college at the same time. And wow. they allow international students to come too. So, um, but the reason why I guess I chose, uh, I had a better relation with God is because obviously in the first like year, uh, when I was in the States, 2012, I was pretty lost spiritually because like I came to the States, new country, new friends, having fun, right? Partying, all that stuff, right? That you try out at college, right? And I would say the first year was just more like fun, right? Just fun. I would still though, I was like looking for a home church. I think at that point I tried, <clears throat> excuse me, I tried like three or four different churches. Um, none of them really clicked because I was from a church in Malaysia that I spent 16 years growing up, right? So trying to find that first home church didn't really like click for a while. And then it wasn't until probably in 2014, maybe 15, actually, two, three years later. So I was still going to church, right? I was in the college, uh, what did they call it? College camp, like the Christian club on campus. So I was helping yeah. to lead that and all that stuff. I didn't have a home church though. So I was doing more of the college stuff. And then it wasn't until I actually joined the military back in 2015, that I became really close to God. So then that was the, wow. the big switch, right? Yeah. What made you go into the military? Uh, the main reason was because that at that time, uh, President Obama had a very special program for foreigners to become a U.S. citizen if they serve in the military. And it's closed now. No one else can get in today. I was one of 5,000 people in the whole country that made it through. And my wife. That's how I met my wife, Jaden, too. Wow. So we both enlisted in the U.S. Army uh, Reserves, um, and then I did it in 2015. I went to basic training in Fort Benning, Georgia. There, at that point, you know, obviously, like, the Army training was tough, and, like, it helped me get so much time to reflect on life, and I just realized I wanted to get closer to God because at that point, he, like, God already blessed me through so much, right? I grew up well. I got to go to the U.S. I got to join the military. I got to become a U.S. citizen. I mean, those were all huge, amazing blessings that I know were like miracles. They weren't just like random or luck. So that's after that point was when I got much closer to God. Yeah. And what, what yeah. was the driving force for you to want to become an American citizen? Like what was, yeah, that's why, a, why is that even important? That's an interesting question. I mean, I guess when I got to experience living in the U.S. for the first time in 2012, Obviously, the only thing I could compare it to was my experience in Malaysia, right? And obviously, I love Malaysia. Malaysia is a beautiful country. It's great. But, you know, the U.S. is a powerhouse in this world, man. It's, uh, it's known. It's, you know, everyone wants to be here, right? It's like Disneyland, <laughs> Universal Studios. I mean, it's beautiful. It's, um, it's different than Malaysia. It's more developed, right? So I saw a lot of, like, my friends in college, you know, they had to either get a work visa they married Americans to become, you know, to get the green cards, right? And I just fell in love with the country, to be honest. I did, I really, and I still do, right? I, I just love the country. I just love North America. I just love the U.S., right? So um, I think that was the biggest reason. Yeah, and you, it's so interesting how we look back, hindsight's twenty twenty. that it says, like, we choose our, our paths, but God directs our steps. And how often that comes in, like, you met your wife in the military. It's like, okay, you're one of 5,000. You right. wouldn't have met your wife probably if it wasn't for the military. So yeah. all those things are very interesting. What you had time to reflect in the military, yes. but what yes. was the key thing? Like, did you have like a certain experience that happened where you were like, all right, I'm sold out or have you been more of those logical? There's some people that are like, oh, I don't really feel God. 
but I know it's true and I do what I'm supposed to, but there's other people that have these crazy experiences. Are you yeah. in the middle? Did you yeah. have an experience? What I was think, it like? I think I'm more in the middle because what I realized was just like, dude, I've been blessed so much by God. There is no, like, I think it's logical, right? There is that at a point it's like, there is no denying how much God has blessed me in my life. And that time I was only 19 and it's already blessed me so much. Today I'm 20, turning 27. He's blessed me even more. So it's like, there is no denying that God is real for me, that God is real to me, right? So then it's like over yeah. time, the confidence just gets higher and higher and higher and higher, right? And for your relationship, were you guys already on that same path when you guys first got together? Uh, with my wife, Jaden? Yeah. Yeah, so Jaden. Like, yeah, yeah, at the Jayden time you would have been girlfriend, boyfriend, and like, correct. were you guys going to church together? Like, was she on yes. the same page? Yeah. So uh, we were actually long distance. So even though we met in the military, uh, we actually met through ROTC or ROTC, right? Which is the commissioning program in U.S. universities. So when I got back from training, I joined, I went back to college, my university, Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. So it's a Lutheran, Lutheran school, actually. Um, and then I did the ROTC program there. I commissioned as an officer. During that time, that two years, it's a very, again, I think this is all part of God's plan. Because I was a foreign national from Malaysia, to become an officer in the U.S. Army, you need a secret clearance. But because I was a foreign national, I had an issue getting my clearance because I was, you know, basically just someone from some other country that came into the, you know, the States like three, four years ago, right? And my, my girlfriend, well, I guess Jaden at that time had the same exact issue. And she actually posted a question on Facebook, on this military Facebook group. I happened to be the moderator in that group, so I answered her question. And then long story short, before you know it, we were texting each other. She was in Chicago. Oh, she was in Carbondale, Illinois. So like Illinois, I was in Washington. We were texted for a year. Um, and then after that, we started dating. And yeah, when we started dating, we just, I, I mean, for me, it was like God and Jesus is like a no, um, it's a non-negotiable. And I think for her too, she grew up in church. She went to summer camps. Her parents go to church every week. And for her as well, like it was just a good fit. I can say though, over time, after we got married, our relationship with God definitely deepened after we got married for sure. Yeah. Wow. That's so awesome. And I, obviously you don't go from college, you come out to the U S you go to college, obviously like you're the taboo, like Asians are about education. Like yep. that's what you, that's what you got to do. And, and you go from there to military. These are not the steps to become an entrepreneur. <laughs> like this isn't what you do to build a business. So you, so you guys get married. What was the process to going into business? I'm assuming you did four years in the military. Yeah. So I was actually reserved in national guard. Um, I've now been in about eight years. I'm getting out this year. Um, oh, but wow, cool. it was all part, it was all part time. Right. So the way I got into business was also a pretty funny story. So, um, after I met Jaden and we started dating, I graduated that year. So I met her in January, 2018. I commissioned and graduated in May 2018. So I was done at school. But because I commissioned into the National Guard, in the, in, in the, National, yeah, in the National Guard, that's only a part-time thing for the military. So I still had to get a full-time job. So I decided to move out to, to Illinois to be closer to Jaden because I was done with school in Washington. And at that point, when I was looking for different jobs, I actually saw an ad from Dan Locke. This was back in 2018 when he was, you know, big and known for the high ticket closer program. I started seeing, you know, this guy, this Asian guy in a red suit, right? Called Dan Locke yeah, yeah. on my Facebook feed. And in, at in first, a, in, a ben, in a Bentley, right? With his, exactly. with his book, F.U. Money. F.U. Yeah. Money. And at that point, at a first, in the beginning, I didn't pay any attention. I was like, oh, I must be some kind of random, you know, like guru or what kind of, you know, he might be just like selling stuff, right? But the thing was, Jaden actually had to go for her, her army training. Uh, for about five weeks, she was away uh, in training. So I was alone in a new city, right? Completely alone. And I had nothing better to do. I'm just going to watch this guy's webinar. So that's how I bought into his program. And then my journey started from there. <laughs> so yeah. you were automatically attracted. You were like, oh, cool. I'll just learn how to close deals and sell. And that was like your initial thing that you saw? Yeah, because again, I graduated from school. I the, this webinar, was it the webinar ad where he's sitting in the Bentley and he talks about that it's not another get rich quick webinar? Is that the, is that the ad that you so saw? Ads, so many ads, but probably that one. Yeah. It had the it was pretty for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's like riding the Bentley and then he sits on the end of it with the, I remember the back door open 
And at the time, I think him and I were in the same mastermind together. So I was like checking out his stuff. Okay. And and I saw a lot, like I saw a lot of his stuff. His stuff was good, man. I, I remember I remember feeling so bad. One time I saw him do a webinar. Maybe you were either maybe working with him or maybe not yet. And this was like, everyone logs into the platform and none of the, none of the technology is working. And he had oh, to literally get everyone to transfer over to a completely yeah. different webinar platform. And he yeah. charged everyone like 50 bucks for the webinar. If you yeah. like, remember that. Yeah. So I, I bought it just to see. Oh, okay. Okay. Were, were you already like, where were you at in that process at that I point? I think I was in the team at that point. I had just joined his team probably a month in. I joined, in, I joined Dan's team back in February, 2019. So you so, you went through his programs and then you were like, I just want to work with this guy. What was the motivation for that? I went through his program and I basically realized I was pretty good at sales. I just, I didn't know that. Right. But, but you know, I got a few gigs like with different entrepreneurs, like remotely and I did okay. And I guess Dan yeah. saw, yeah, I really wanted to work with Dan because um, I, I liked his, you know, I liked his vibe. He was a good mentor and, and I just connected with him. I just resonated with him. And so I talked, I reached out to his team and be like, Hey, I want to work with you guys. And long story short, they brought me in. I first met when I actually, you know what, when I first worked with Dan was when I first met you in funnel hacking Live 2019, that was in Nashville, mm -hmm. February. That was my first official event with Dan. I had just joined his team back in February, 2019. Were you walking with him when him and I said, hello, yeah. like, uh, okay, cool. So, and yeah. you guys had a lot of people. So it was hard for me to, correct. Yeah, you know. correct. I like, was his bodyguard during the event. I was basically following him during the entire event, helping him with everything. So I was the guy that was like following him around. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Why, why do you why do you air quote bodyguard? Where you like ah, I don't well, know if yeah, I could really be like an official bodyguard. I just you know I just I guess yeah. I mean I was a sales manager, or sales right, salesperson right. So <laughs> yeah. And, and really, when I look at Dan, I don't know a ton about him, but just the story of kind of introvert. English, not maybe not the first language, one of the languages, obviously, because he's great at speaking English, but it's like accent, a lot of the things that you think would really hold you back. Right. Uh, obviously, even Asian culture, right? It's like yes. you probably fit with Dan because you saw, hey, this Asian dude like is out here getting it, like making moves yeah. and like yeah. you fit with that, right? It's like so yeah. all those different things I think would line so well. And I think the story in general is impressive. How, how was your time working with them? Because obviously now, like, you've right. realized you're great at sales, and now this is a part of what you do as your company. But, like, at the time when you're working with them, how was that process? Like, how did you enjoy yeah. working with him? And any tips as well? Maybe some people are working as an entrepreneur right now, right. and they don't know when to, when to blast off on their own or, or how to right. take advantage of that time well. Yeah, good question. Let me start. This, this, this is so much to unpack here, but let me start with the um... – let me start with the faith part first, because I think there's a lot there. So the, the biggest thing, so like, I love my time at Dan's company. I learned so much. I wouldn't be where I am today without, you know, the opportunity he's given me. Uh, he's still a mentor I look up to, right? I, I, and, you know, I will always appreciate him and the team. Are you, are you guys still connected as well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. We don't talk, we don't talk often, but we have, we have good, we have good, there's no bad relationship. It's good. Yeah, yeah, cool. But the faith part, though, was the always the thing that kept nagging, like, I guess, nicking at my, my mind the entire time I was with the company was that no one in the company was Christian, actually, right? I think we had one Catholic person, and it was a team of, like, 50 people. So I was like, so basically what happened during that three and a half, four years was I had to really numb, like, quiet down my faith. Like, I didn't talk about it. I didn't share about it. That's why, to, to this day... That experience made me want to make up for it. That's why I'm more vocal about it today because, like, mm. I felt like I was four years being trapped. And it's not really anyone's fault, right? It's my, I mean, I take ownership, right? I could have said something. I yeah. didn't, right? I was probably scared or, or nervous or shy or, you know, whatever, right? Young. You know, I was 22 at that point when I joined this company. So 21, yeah. actually. But I didn't, it was stifled. So I, I had basically very, like, only thing I did was win a church on Sundays, and that was it. So that wasn't a good time in my life for my faith, but I realized there was something with it. Then I, you know, when I left his company exactly a year ago, the past year I've been very vocal about it. Because now I'm like, yeah, now I know what I want to do and what I stand for. That's so interesting. And I wonder what that was like even for you in Malaysia. Like Malaysia is not a Christian country. It's no. like a Muslim country, right? Yes. So 
I could even tell like coming back into the US, I was like, ah, oh, so like glad to be surrounded by like basically a Christian founded country <laughs> that has yeah. the whole Bible Belt out here in Texas. And there's something about right. it. I obviously I want to go and and be a light in a dark situation and like spread the gospel, but I don't want to live there with no influence on me. Right. Right. Like right. where I where I don't have anyone pouring into me. And I could totally feel the difference. I'm sure you could as well. You grew up as a Christian in a country that isn't a Christian country. I went to um, an awesome church what, while I was out there, collective, mm. uh, while I was out there in Malaysia. And that's okay. that's and Peng Jun and Chu Ying and I and a bunch of friends went out there. Uh, nice. But it was you know downtown KL, basically. I don't really know nice. the area that well. But I, even that, it was like one service, right? Packed service, big service. But here in the U.S., you got like 9 a.m., 10, 30, 12, yeah. night exactly. service. Thursday exactly. night, Saturday night, you yeah. know, like all of it. Exactly. What, exactly. what was that like as well, growing up in a country like that, where most people, again, are Muslim? Yeah, you know, in my city in Kuching and in, in East Malaysia, where actually Xu Ying is not far from, she's also from East Malaysia, from a different city, um, a different town, rather. I actually, like I said, my parents were super involved with the church, which meant that all of our family friends were Christian. So really growing up, it felt like it, was, it felt like you were in the Christian bubble, maybe there. It was way more. It was like I think growing up, six the first sixteen years of my life was very like Christian, right? I just mm. didn't have a very strong personal relationship with God, but it was very Christian. Yeah. So yeah. you almost came to the U.S. and like experienced the partying side. Yeah. <laughs> You're like so go I to the Christian to the country and get exactly. I came to the U.S. You know, like basically had no real relation with God at six, seventeen, sixteen. Had to find my way through that and then develop my own relationship with him right through that time yeah that's so wild man and and it's so cool to see the stuff that you learn from being in those tougher situations even working with dan's company like you said yeah. you probably could have said stuff it's just no one else believed what you believed and and we're really big even here on like nobody has the reason to keep the standard that you and i have if they haven't had the same experiences right there's people right. that like you know, think that we would judge them or something. And I'm like, bro, I don't judge you. Like I, <laughs> why would you do what I do when you haven't had our experience and had an encounter with Jesus and, and giving right. your life over to him and made him right. Lord of your life. So like, right. you know, it's all good. So, yeah, but it's tough to be in those situations sometimes. What do you think? Like, I, I don't really know much about Dan Locke's story and the company. I want to hear about your transition and what you guys are doing now, but there's gotta be a lot of great learning experiences that you had. Like what, what were the core things that you think he could have done better? And the reason I say this is because I, I, I was talking about this afterwards when I saw what happened to Dan, like meaning he's not as present on social and all these yes. other things. Yes. I saw other people do the opposite where something bad would come out about them or, you know, there's always going to be opposition and they just chose to continue forward. Liver right. King. You ever follow that guy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I know. Yeah. Oh yeah, 1000. So think about this. This guy's literally lying to the world with millions yep. of followers and is literally telling people a direct lie. I am not taking steroids. Right. And he's not to natural. the point where I believed him. I go, "Man, is why would he lie about that? That's just so right. dumb." But like, right. you know, people that know right. it comes out and he's like, "I am on $15,000 a month of steroids." And yeah. and human growth hormone, all these things. Mm -hmm. And all he decided to do was to fess up, go on all the podcasts and apologize make a meme out of it, become more transparent and probably has grown. If not, he will probably grow bigger than he ever has been before. Yeah. Like, yeah. The, and, and I didn't see that same reaction. What do you think went wrong or happened? And what did you take away from that? Yeah. You know, I think, I think the biggest lesson I learned, and this is actually really, really big. It's not just for business, but in life. I think it's really humility, right? Like ego, humility, extreme ownership. Like, I think a lot of people are afraid to make mistakes. And when they do make mistakes, it's better to cover it up and hide it instead of like owning up to it. Right. Um, hmm. So I think the biggest lesson I learned is like, number one, it's very normal to make mistakes. Just be uh, my partner, my business partner, Steven calls it, just be a one mistake learner. As long as you mm -hmm. are a one mistake learner, you're fine. You, you can't, you should make mistakes. You can't make mistakes. And then, own up to the mistakes. Don't yeah. sleep it under the rug. Don't try to hide it, right? Because like you said, like with Liver King, 
people actually respect you more when you fess up, right? And I think, you know, maybe that was missing. In, to in to an extent, yeah. I don't think he's quite over it yet. You know, I think he no. would be on Joe Rogan already if he was, uh, right. he's got to build back his reputation. Right, right. But yeah, people but are giving him the opportunity to. Exactly. Yeah. It's better than just staying quiet and saying, oh, well, nothing. I didn't do, it's not my fault. I didn't do anything wrong, right? It's just, you know, yeah. you guys misheard me. I didn't say that. I wasn't like he, instead of trying to cover it up, right? It's like you, you be, be honest about it and then just take yep. ownership. What, so, what do you, what actually went wrong? Like, I don't even know what happened. I would say we had, um, well, there was, you know, issues with like clients, for example, like the courses that we sold, you know, people wanted refunds, right? Like, and then they weren't given, the company didn't give refunds. So then there were like legal disputes, right? Um, there were people that went to, you know, CoffeeZilla, the YouTube channel and talked about Dan, you know, calling him a scammer, things like that, saying that he took clients money. I think over time, it's just like, the reputation of unhappy clients, which is also another big thing, which I learned is like, if someone wants a refund, just give them the refund. Sure. I mean, you have all these agreements and everything, but like, if, if, if it's like a real thing that could really harm your reputation, I mean, no problem. Right. Like, right. That, that's a big thing. Like at, at that company, we almost never, like we never give refunds for no, for any reason. Right. Which I think there needs to be some kind of balance, right? You can't be all extreme. And yeah. So that was just the reputation. <laughs> yeah and do you think yeah. it was done out of like a good heart like he just like boundaries and you know i'm sure he was up front with all of it in the first place and then people would join and and want to stop and and so you know what do you think part of it was just like a, a misunderstanding or a mess up I, I don't know honestly that part i never really asked about asked him personally about why we didn't give free i think the i think the whole well this is an assumption i think the the underlying thought was that this is an info product so if you buy it you have to implement it and if you don't you're not going to get results therefore you don't warrant any refund right but again there's arguments to go both sides i just think now going through the experience if someone buys my info so i have sales training courses right now if someone buys my sales training and they tell me joel this is the worst training i've ever been through like you got to improve it and work on it Instead of like getting offended or trying to defend myself, I'll be like, oh, thanks for your feedback. Here's your refund because right, I don't deserve your money. Like that would be my, my response now. Isn't that part of like, a sales process though? Is like you have unique selling propositions, you have risk reversal, you have guarantees. Yes. Were these not used to sell people? Like risk no reversal, guarantees. right? There were no guarantees. Okay, so, so, you guys were just up, so you guys were just like, hey, bro, like there is no guarantees. We guarantee you'll get the course. But if you don't do anything, then it's up to you and, and people. Yeah. yeah. So that's just a tough, tough. So why, why didn't he just hammer back? Like it was really that coffeezilla thing that, that really hit you guys. Why didn't he just be like, keep going on what he was doing? Why did, why did it shake him? If it shook him, I don't even know. Yeah. I don't, that part, I don't know. Cause I left the company a year ago. He definitely got more quiet in the last, when I left, actually, I think he got more quiet. Um, I don't know. At that part, I actually don't know. Maybe he just feel like the whole personal brand influencer thing isn't for him anymore. I, yeah. Do you feel like he was different as an influencer than he was in real life? He is very nice guy. Like in in person, he's a great guy. Very friendly. That's, yeah, exactly. That's what I saw too. Right. It's like yep. totally yep. nice. He definitely had a different persona. When back when he was wearing the red suit with the Bentley, that was a very different like mask. Because that was like, hey, this is Dan Law. Let me teach you how to get financial free, like financial, like he's very, you know, sort of like he was just a different person on camera, right? For for that part. I wonder how hard that part is, like, because it's, it's not that easy to keep that up, especially if like you're getting hate. But I would say like a Liver King, like there's no way Liver King is sitting there like that all day. Like that, that persona, you look at his old content right. and it was pretty garbage, but then he kind of makes a good point of like i would just didn't know how to be myself on camera now i'm more myself and i could see that maybe that's it as well but bro that that's a tough thing to keep up when you're when you get that type of hate you know and i think that's the reason why i think because his authentic self is not the same as what's on camera i think that's where it's hard i think when you're actually the same on camera and in person i think then you're like no it's okay it's me 
I'm just me. Yeah. Right. I'm authentic. Right. I think. I think. I think you're right. I think that probably was. That probably was what stopped everything. I, w- I wonder if he'll make a comeback that way. Is he still doing like all of his? The company's still running and just not producing content. Is that basically what's going on? I've heard he has slowed down his personal brand for sure. Um, I've heard also this is all through the grapevine because I don't I haven't spoken to him for many months now that he is going to run um, like uh, other companies as like a co CEO in the background. But again, this, these are all rumors. I don't know how much of it's true. Yeah, for sure. So you leave from there and you realize, man, I'm like, and you, and just so everyone knows, like you're running a lot of the sales stuff there. Can you kind of explain like what you did that way people know like your yeah, role and sure. what your responsibility was? Yeah. So I started as a closer. Um, I made my first six figure in, uh, in commissions that year, you know, as a closer, which is really good, right? Because I never made six figures. So I could even dream, could never even dream of that. Like military won't even get you to six figures for at least like 15, 20 years, right? So yeah. I made my six figures doing sales. I got promoted to assistant sales manager, sales manager, and then eventually sales director. And the biggest team I led for them was 110 closers and setters. Uh, we had, I had 10 sales leaders and four sales managers under me at that point. So we were running a big operation selling info and coaching products. That's wild. So you, so you leave there and kind of to walk us through the process of, did you already know, okay, what made you transition out? Cause maybe this will speak to some other people, not just about Dan and his company though, if that's a piece of it. But like other people as well, maybe are in a space where they're again in that entrepreneur. I just got a friend with my or off the phone, my friend Billy. He has blessed entrepreneur, but also has Candy Cairo, I think it is, mm-hmm. and and he was basically a marketing guy for a chiropractic company, and now has four hundred clients that are chiropractors and doing it just over four million a year. Wow. And I'm like, wow, that's a great train. Like he learned, and then knew yes. it was time to transition. Yes. What was that process like for you? Yeah. Um, I think speaking to the whole entrepreneur to entrepreneur, I already knew, I guess like a long, well, not a long, maybe not a long time ago. I would say probably three years ago that I wanted, I eventually would grow off the company. I mean, it was very iffy because here's the thing. Growing up in Malaysia, right? In the Asian culture, you're taught to get a good job be a doctor, be an, in fact, when I came to the U S I was a pre-med, I was doing biochemistry and all that stuff, right? Like biology and pre-med, yeah. I was only a doctor, right? Um, I was never taught to like, Oh, go run a business, go open a business. Right. So that was never in my mind. I guess it changed when I, you know, did the high ticket closing program and started doing sales. And I realized, Oh, you know what? Maybe I could do it. But even then, even in Dan's company, I was always told that Joel, you are not a, you're not like an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur. You're an operator. You are an who, who operator. You're an in- Where did you hear this? I just heard it from the different executives on the team and from Dan. They, maybe they didn't say it directly to me, but it was more like I felt like I was. they were trying to keep me in a company, right? Like So I yeah. don't do my own thing. Uh, yep. It was a bit more obvious when I got older, for sure. When I got more mature. And what, what do you think would have made you stay? Because also there's people like myself, maybe yourself, that's like, well, you know, I'd rather keep that high performer in the company rather than there's always going to be the entrepreneurs that launch out and do their own thing. Yeah. But like, what would have, what do you feel like would have been necessary to keep you as like a core team member as maybe a partner inside of that company? I think, yeah. I think, I think uh, at a point when I became sales director or executive sales director, there was no room for growth anymore. It was so like maybe, maybe a, a partial equity stake or yeah, exactly. something that makes you feel like you're helping grow the whole thing and getting exactly. upside. Exactly. Because I was, at the end of the day, I'm just growing Dan's business. Yeah. Right? I'm just growing someone else's business. I had only a very good salary and a very good um, uh, comp uh, plan for commissions and overrides, but I had no equity. I had no profit share. So, you know, and I had no growth. I was stuck. I was capped at my position. Yeah. So sorry to interrupt you. Keep going on the transition out. And then what happened? Okay. And then at a the time I had a, it's interesting on my way out, uh, I had a buddy reach out to me uh, and I've known him for like a year on Instagram and he was a financial options trader, uh, invested Henry actually. It was like, Hey, you know, we should partner up. And actually I pushed him off for a whole year because I was like working with Dan. Right. Um, but when I was about to leave, I was like, all right, you know what? Let's do it. So actually him, Myself and my wife, Jaden, because my wife also worked with Dan for about six months and she did a lot of like supporting community stuff and event stuff. We actually partnered up with Henry 
and we ran up his um, basically his, his entire company, right? So we went from he did a million a year in 2021. Last year we did about 2.7, close to three mil, right? So when we stepped in, so basically I had a trend, I had a nice transition. I went from Dan's team member employee to becoming a partner with my friend, and then I also left Henry last year. Then I so now I'm really focused on my own thing. So it was like a, it was like a transition like that. Right? Yeah, employee, business partner, and then now I'm like my own my own brand, my own thing. Yeah, yeah, and like if I were to peel back the onion on it a little bit, where where do you feel like like for my, my wife and I like every process is through prayer. Like I even caught myself today. Mm-hmm. This is a very tiny situation, but I caught myself just doing like the logical thing, and it's not really working. And mm-hmm. I really sat down. And I was like, okay, like why don't I just pull out my journal right here and write down like, Hey God, this is the situation. Which direction do you want me to take? I thought, and, and I had a, like, my direction is a very biblical direction. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not like doing the wrong thing. I, I right. literally was like, you know, I thought I'm doing a good thing, but I, I'm not, right. it's not working. <laughs> and so I'm right. kind of like getting kind of frustrated going, I really haven't asked God about this. And like, what does he say? What does his word say? Uh, how was, th- how did you really, incorporate God and business yes. together during these transitions. Yeah. So like I said, right at the tail end of my time at Dan, I already knew the thing that kept nigging at me was the most was just like, I wasn't really vocal about my faith and I've already been in there three years. This has to change. I can't keep living like that because if I keep living like that, I'm going to grow further away from God. So yeah. like at that company, I had to go. Um, and then when I had to go, my partner, uh, the, the partner, Henry, he, he's not Christian. He's Jewish, actually. But he's not like, I don't think he's super religious, right? Um, but during that period of time, because I left Dan's company, it gave me a lot of freedom and flexibility to travel and meet a lot of people. So last year, I did a lot of traveling to that. So then I think a big pivotal moment was like the whole process of like God and me being closer to God was, um, you know, Ryan Pineda, right? You know, yep. off Ryan Pineda? So Ryan's very yeah, yeah. vocal about Christian, about his Christian faith. Christian. No way. Yeah, Ryan's super vocal about being Christian. So my Jade and I actually uh, invested, I say invested, not paid, but we actually, you know, paid Ryan to go play golf with Ryan in Vegas back in May last year. And that was a, that was a big, I mean, that was probably a big, that was probably a moment that changed, I guess, my life and business in general, because during that four hours, like Ryan just poured into me. He was like, you wow. know, we need more men. We need more men like you. We need more God needs more leaders like you. Then he told me about Pete Vargas. He connected me to Pete Vargas. He told me about Wellspring. Yeah. So Ryan was the guy that boosted my relationship with God even further. Wow. So because of that interaction last May, it's only been what seven, eight months to now. Since then I have become more vocal about God in business. So That's that was wild. like I, for some reason I've only seen Ryan's clips. I just sent him a picture of us. I don't oh, know him well. Awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know that some of my friends have been on his podcast and stuff. I think is he out in Vegas? Is that what you said yes, he was? Out in Vegas. Yeah, we play golf in Vegas. Yeah, and and obviously I'm in Pete's mastermind. Love it. Yes. Phenomenal, phenomenal yes. group. Even Billy yes. that I just talked to earlier, he's inside the mastermind as well. Oh, I love it, love it. And so yeah, that's that's wild. I didn't know that about Ryan. I just literally sent him a picture because I've never said anything besides. I commented on one of his stories. I was, I just looked. Oh, and that's no, all I've Brian ever said. is like, be, be, actually besides, you know what? It's funny. I think you, you, Pete and Ryan, and I guess Russell, but Russell doesn't really speak about faith much. So I think you, Pete and Ryan are the three men in this. Well, I know actually Cody Jefferson too, actually Cody Jefferson too. And then Sean, um, Sean Whalen. Yeah. I think very few people I can name. I can name on one hand that are actually vocal about Christianity in this space, at least that, that I know of, right? So yep. I'm always like excited and always inspired to meet people like you all because I'm like, right, I want to be like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you say in this space, because it's not hard to find someone vocal, but who is someone who's actually doing things that you respect right. that work in the same world? You know, it's like if you're an athlete, it'd be like a football player who's mm-hmm. speaking out and you respect mm-hmm. them more because you're playing pro football. Right. So it's you're football. Yeah, exactly. So I think that yeah. that's a, a really big deal with it. And so that you, you had talked about that, that, that those experience, I love that you talked about like the people that you're around as well. I feel like for me, even Pete inspired me. I talked to him on Monday, today's Tuesday. So I guess yesterday. 
and, and I said that to him. I was like, hey, like what I've done and the more vocal I've been, it's been partially because he stepped up, but he was inspired mm-hmm. by someone who was inspired by someone. So like it's been this ripple yes. effect. Yeah. I was like, I didn't really know that this was possible, partially because I didn't want to feel like we are using God to grow a business. Right. That's what everyone's big fear would be, right? Is like right. are you right. using this to like grow something? Right. And I'm like And I've seen I've seen people do it in a not really, I guess good way yeah like not moral for yeah, me not. it was more to be more myself because i was teaching all these things and i was like all right i learned this from god i learned it from scripture but how do i say it in a way that everyone else understands and right. i never was really able to like sharpen and talk about the things that i actually cared about without putting on like a filter and mm-hmm. i was like i'm just yep. i'm just tired of it like that, yep. that was literally that, that yeah. was it and and also it's because i have to teach it and bring it to stuff like the show and prepare for things it's making my walk with jesus just more impactful but like more congruent where i'm not like having to put him on the side while i work all day i'm like no like i get to talk about him and everything that i do this is so cool and through the work that we're doing we're getting respect with the world everyone else right it's like yeah you know i i have great friends that that aren't christians that we get to pour into and and it's just, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. So are you and your wife now then working together in the vision that you guys are building? Kind of break down what you guys are doing now. Yeah. It, yeah. So, and I love, uh, what I, I love about it, by the way, real quick. I love, I love that everything that you're doing is stacking on the skill sets and things that you've been put through that's built you and prepared you for this. You didn't just transition to something completely different. Right. You've been getting prepared for this. So yes, walk us through exactly. what that is. Um, I will say too, like our home church here in Vancouver, the reason why we're also staying here when you asked me early today is because I actually, we actually found a home church in Vancouver. It's in Richmond. It's called Thrive Church. Uh, the pastor's name is Pastor JB. Um, amazing church. We actually started serving there a month ago, no, two, three weeks ago. So like now we feel really plugged in. We're in the small group there. So it's like, we finally found a home church after years of traveling around doing different things. Um, that's been really big. And then in terms of like my skills, yes. So our company is called Scale Team Circle. So Scale Team is basically like a scaling team, right? Uh, initially, I created that name because uh, after I left Dan, the first thing I did was sales management consulting or, and sales training. So I came into clients, this company, like, for example, Brandon Carter has been a client of mine, King Keto, for like seven months now. So I helped them with mm-hmm. the sales process. I trained their sales reps. I did that in the beginning. And I had this vision for helping turn sales people into scale people, right? Pe- people that could help companies scale, not just do sales, but do more than sales, right? Help with marketing, help with the support, help with the product development, right? Help with the product market fit. So that was my initial journey last year. Then what I realized was that, you know what? I did something at Dan's company and at Brandon that was really, really, I guess, big that no one really talks about. And I call it sales farming which you might know it as database reactivation, right? The biggest difference here is that number one, we focus on high ticket and we use salespeople. And we basically turn, for example, companies with leads, every company has leads, correct? but not every company close every single lead. You don't get a hundred percent conversion rate, right? At Dan's company, we had a million leads and only like 40,000 customers, for example. So what happens to those, you know, 95% of leads sitting in your CRM or on spreadsheets? Well, our company comes in, we use AI and we use automations, email, voicemail, and text. And we literally farm all those dead leads and turn them into book calls for companies. So that's what we're focused on now. And I think God has blessed it tremendously and it's, yeah, it's going very well. So break, break down how, how, what's the package? Like how do people hire you guys then? Yeah. So it's such a new offer because I, we just launched it in February. So like last early last month, um, right now we're doing a 25 K setup fee. And that includes a 90 day money back guarantee. So if you don't make 20, if we can't make 25 K for you in 90 days from your dead lease, we'll give you a full refund, right? That's it. So it's a complete no brainer. We'll write 30 days worth of content for you, farming content. So it'll be emails, texts, and voicemail drops. We'll make sure your team, your sales, your closers are ready, trained up. And then we're also going to give you our setters that will go into the software and book calls for your closer. So that's the offer right now. Yeah. And, and then what's it look like after the 90 days or the 25 K setup? 
Yeah, so this is actually where we're still working on the ascension because we, we haven't had a recurring ascension put into it yet. We don't know whether we're going to go into the ref share route or we're just going to do a flat monthly retainer. So maybe a flat monthly retainer would be like 5K a month. You continue hiring our setters. Uh, you continue, we'll continue writing copy, farming copy for you. And we'll continue launching farming, we'll continue launch farming campaign for you. It's awesome, man. I, I love hearing the innovation because AI is such a big deal now. There's so much opportunity. Yes. And just to see you guys yes. like innovate on top of, of what's already pre-established, I think is just really cool, man. And so you, did you say that you guys are working together now, you and your wife? Yeah. So my wife and I have always been working together since Henry days. So Henry will be like last early last year. Well, technically since, since, uh, Dan lock days, yeah, bro, you yeah, guys she were double dipping. Yeah. Yeah. Six, she did, she did Dan for six months back in 2019. Then she left uh, for that too. Yeah. Yeah. I just think it's funny. Cause it's like, it's like, you guys are double dipping. You guys are both married and both working in the same company. So yes. you have two, two salaries getting pulled in, which is yeah. awesome. I think it's fun. Yeah. And at what, how, how did you guys establish your, your roles? I feel like it's almost like husbands and wives were, and I, I'm going to get in trouble for this one, but like meant to work together in a way, no matter what you're building a vision together. Right. Right. But usually relationships are very opposites. So like, how did yes. you guys establish like your roles inside of the company? Yeah. In fact, we're still figuring it out every day as we speak. Like she went from being our head of support. Now she's my basically content manager. She does all my content on social media. She manages the content team. Um, and it, I think it evolves, you know, I think it's because like yeah. right now she's very passionate about going to naturopath school. So like, and becoming the ND, a uh, naturopathic cool. doctor. Yep. So yeah. like, and I, I support her fully, like, you know, go do that. Right. So she's like basically helping me part time, which is perfect. Yeah. Dude. Well, I, I appreciate you being on here. I love hearing the, the process that you've been through, how God's showing up in your life. Also, it's cool to have someone that's been a Christian forever and then have that that type of experience. One thing that I'd love for you to close on is just to quickly yes. pray for the people that are listening that, yep. you know, that, that, that the experiences that you've had, that, that they'd be impactful for them as well. And then we'll wrap up. Perfect. Yeah. I got a hard stop too. <laughs> Let's get I do a quick prayer for everybody. Yep. All right. So dear Lord, uh, for those, you know, we thank you for giving us this time to be together myself and Nicholas and for everyone watching, you know, continue bless and take care of everybody here and, you know, the visions and the plans that you have set for them and the goals and the desires that they have in their hearts. Let that come to fruition. Let your will and your path be walked. And may we just, you know, always, always pray and always reach out to you and, and be connected to you when we have uh, forks in our road and when we can confuse and we are not unsure about things to do. Just, you know, be that light, be that guide for us and always remind us that you are near. And thank you again for this business, this opportunity, this journey, this life. And yeah, and for everything, for everyone watching, for everyone listening, just bless them, take care of their families, keep them safe and healthy. Um, this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, man. Thanks so much again.